guys, welcome back to Scream Queen Stream. I'm Jessica Cameron and I'm really excited. Today I have with me one of my favorite human beings in the world and specifically the horror world, Del from Dark Delicacies. Thank How you, you doing? I'm glad to be a Scream Queen's dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tongue twister, right? It is. <laughs> So I have been coming to the store since 2011, as soon as I moved to Los Angeles, and it is such a staple in the indie and genre world, and something that is so near and dear to my heart. For those of you guys who are not familiar, we're going to talk a lot about the store, and we're going to put a bunch of links down below, and I highly encourage you guys to check out the website, check out the merch. A lot of what we talk about, even if you don't come to LA, if you want a signed piece, if you want something from an official signing that he does coming up in the future, he's always reachable by email or on any of his social platforms and you can get it at home and we'll get more into this, but he doesn't overcharge for any of it. So you can actually buy a Blu-ray if the cast and crew is here signing it for the same price as you're buying a Blu-ray plus shipping. You're not paying $20 per signature, which is really great. Thanks. Yeah, I mean that was one of the uh, founding rules of the store <laughs> that if we're selling a Blu-ray and you're here as the actress or director or whatever it is signing that Blu-ray, you sign that Blu-ray for free. But that gets the people here. Mm -hmm. Then people sell their photos or the posters people bring in or whatever it might be, and it's always seemed to work out. I think to both sides' advantage, I which is a, it's hard to get a win-win. It totally is, especially now when horror conventions are kind of letting a lot of these celebrities run amok. And I'm not saying that to bash anyone. I'm just saying that as a genre fan, it's amok. very hard. They are running amok, right? <laughs> like it's it's hard for me to not understand a fellow fan's frustration when they say, I really wanted so-and-so's autograph, but there was a three-hour lineup and they were charging $120. And it cost me 50 to get into the place and exactly. 20 for parking. Mm -hmm. And then gas, hotel, time yeah. off work sometimes. Here you just can't find a parking place, so it works out. <laughs> we actually found really easy parking today. <laughs> So now, we'll jump right into it. We are going to touch back on that stuff. But wow, I'm, is that your question? There's, yeah, my Electronically, <laughs> this is, oh, ain't science grand. Isn't it wonderful? It is good. Yeah. I thought about, like, if it would be more legitimate if I had an actual paper, you know, on a clipboard, but I felt it's so not 2018, 2019 now. You could do, like, that Rachel Maddow thing and circle things while you're talking. <laughs> I wanted to uh, bring this up. I mean, I could. I probably won't. Uh, starting off, I really want to know, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? I'm a Detroit kid. Okay, Michigan. So I am it. Michigan. If I never see snow again, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. And um, my childhood was, was pretty normal. Uh, <laughs> my dad was a Detroit cop, and uh, my mom always worked because you didn't make much money as a Detroit mm -hmm. cop. Um, and I had a brother and a sister, but we were so far apart, we were almost like um, only children. Oh, wow. Because my brother was six years older than me, and my sister is ten years younger than me. So that, that spread, it's like we all grew up individually. It wasn't like I was the middle child, you know. They say all that psychiatric stuff, the first child gets this. I mean, that. I'm a middle child. Are so. you a middle child, too? Yeah. So <laughs> we're was, supposed to have some kind of hang-up. I don't remember what the whole thing is, but. We're, we're, okay. we're not treated like the baby, and we're not given all the firsts that the eldest is. Right, right. So we get ignored. But I didn't feel ignored. Did you feel ignored? Not really, but I also kind of kept to myself by choice. I yeah. didn't really get along with my siblings when I was a child, and I kind of preferred solo company than company of others if I didn't like them. Well, and my sister being 10 years younger, she was too young, and my brother being six years older, once you get to be about junior high, six years is huge. Oh, it's massive. So, yeah. It's Massive. I remember being 16 and thinking 22-year-olds were like old men. Like yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I look at my brother's graduation picture still in his yearbook, and they were like, the difference in six years to the generations, you know, we all had long hair and T-shirts and stuff, and they were in suits and looked like they were going to the bank for a loan. You know, it, it's very strange. Now, were you a horror fan as a child? Yeah, well, actually, I forced myself to be a horror fan because when I was younger, meaning like grade schoolish, I was a huge scaredy kid. Oh, really? um, and my number one scare was the dark. I didn't like to go into the dark. So um, I think I kind of forced myself to watch horror movies and go to matinees at the theater and all of that kind of thing to push myself out of it because I knew exposure would do that for me. That is really, really intelligent of a child to come to that conclusion. But I didn't go sit like in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> so. so 
the one thing I don't know, and I did read a bunch of articles, and obviously I've known you forever, and it was funny, somebody asked me this question, and I didn't know the answer. I thought I did. I started to answer it. I was like, oh, well, as a map, I don't know. How did you get your start in horror in the industry? In the store or in the industry? In the industry, because I know I know a little bit about your store, which we'll get okay. to in a minute. How you originally started uh, doing conventions, and then that led to your store in '94. But what led to choosing to rep it in the conventions? I think I got into horror originally because back in Michigan, um, I was acting. Um, I was PR director of a dinner theater company and. Um, doing some stuff with AFTRA. I was doing voiceover for um, Shrine Circus at the time and I was the voice of Clarion Stereos and a couple of little things like that in the Detroit market. And then um, I realized that the furthest, you, the biggest celebrity, i.e. meaning pay, the biggest pay you could get to, <coughs> excuse me, in that market was the local newscaster. I mean, they were the most recognizable and highest paid person. You know, I could do industrials all my life for one of the uh, auto companies. Uh, like, oh, here's a, they put me in a Buick Skylark because being small of stature, it made the interior of the car look bigger, right? More roomy. <laughs> True. So they would always team me up with a short gal and they'd show me the roomy inside of the new Buick Skylark. And those were the films like you'd go to the dealer and they'd play on the, on the little machine. I didn't want to do that all my life, or, or uh, training films for companies on how not to be bullied and, you know, things like that. So when I came out here as an actor, I wanted to, to expand those horizons, and I did a couple of plays and stuff, but my natural instinct toward writing and reading and acting was always horror. And when I met my wife, Sue, she was a big horror fan, so it kind of became a blended family. <laughs> <laughs> Us and our horror people. <laughs> and from that, how did you get doing conventions? Well, we couldn't find anything to, like tchotchkes around the house, to, to express our taste when we moved in together. And I would go through catalogs and I'd find one this thick and there'd be one page and it would have that stupid winged dog from Toscano Garden, <laughs> Gargoyle, you know. Yeah. And that was it. You couldn't find horror stuff unless you sent in from the back of Famous Monsters or something. So we decided to come up with an idea to collect this stuff and get multiples and then see if there were other idiots like us out there. <laughs> And, and we, did, we did two conventions. We did a table, and they were one-day conventions. And this was before the real advent of conventions. They were more like comic swap meets or, or you know, it was... like 80s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I moved out here in 81, so this would be like early 90s. Okay. And, and we did that, like, oh, you'd be at the banquet room at the Red Lion Inn, and, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And we saw that there was an interest. So we went and we, um, I found a storefront one day just down the street from here. And I came back home and I said to Sue when she came in from work, hey, I found your store. And she's like, what? Yeah, we talked about it, you know, your store. We went, we leased it, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing, <laughs> I swear to God. So we opened it with our own collection as stock. And Sue would sell a book and then she'd go in the back room and she'd cry because she had just gotten rid of part of her stuff <laughs> and then she'd come back out and sell another one until she we got to the point where we realized this is our collection it's just revolving it just changes all the time and we still have stuff at home but not like this no you know i'm here more hours a day than i'm home so the home is is more decorated like a home with a few shelves here and there, as opposed to like a collector's home. Yeah, mine has floor to ceiling everything. <laughs> yeah, like yours, or uh, you know, um, Mike he collects the action oh, figures. Right, know. that's it. Mike Mendes has an amazing collection. He does, and um, but that's that's he doesn't have a store. If he had a store, he'd probably have a store full full of the stuff he likes. True. So. Sure. That's it. You've been doing retail since 94. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit um, about how the market has changed. Because obviously, in 2018, it's a very different world than it was back when you started in 1994. Well, one obvious thing is that 
all of this shit's available. It wasn't there in 1994. I've seen the, the evolution of products. Uh, books obviously were there and, and horror novels and stuff, but all these toys, all these collectibles, horror socks and you know, things that, that local um, artists and artisans are creating, it's, it just was not available. So basically, our first store had a t-shirt rack and, and some books and then a couple of odd things, you know. So the, the, biggest, the biggest change I've seen is in the items themselves. Then with the advent of all the items came the fans because they realized, ooh, I can have that. I mean, this is what I would have liked if when I was a kid, but it, it wasn't there. So we didn't have money then anyway, we were kids. So now we have money and we're older, so it's like we can, we can be kids again, the way we wanted, <laughs> you know, not the way our parents wanted us to be here, that kind of thing. Are you finding that genre fans are still excited about physical media, not just DVDs and Blu-rays, but physical, because obviously we look around, your store sells physical media in mm -hmm. so many types. Right. You know, and I think it's so easy for us to get down on VOD and the increase of Netflix and all of these things that I see my fellow genre filmmakers get really upset over. But are you seeing that from a consumer side? Are you seeing them sort of, you know, waning towards the physical media, going towards VOD? Yeah. And, and some. Uh, for me, yes, thankfully. That's a yes, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the different platforms, one of the changes in horror, of course, is now we have a million platforms you can get on television, and the amount of product out there is overwhelming. The amount of product is to the point of you're not even able to see everything that's out there, let alone know how to find it. You know, like, I go to the movies and... Um, before the movies, they have those, before the previews, they have those advertisements and stuff. And it'll go like, oh, season five of Hillbilly Hooker Killers on, you know, the Boo Boo Channel. And I'm like, why is this season five and I've never even heard of it? <laughs> number two, what the hell is the Boo Boo Channel? <laughs> and number three is, how do I find it? You know, I mean, there's so many platforms that you're not even aware of what's out there. But I think the good part of that change in the industry is that it gives people like you and I, and you, our cameraman, and you at home, um, so many more outlets to be able to show our stuff. We didn't have those either. I really personally like the biggest change I've seen is how it's enabled us to come together as a community. Now that's a good and a bad thing because when I say come together as a community there are some who choose to sort of use their platforms for malicious intent, you know, with like a lot of insults and, and misunderstandings. You mean like Facebook stuff? Yeah, like social media and yeah. just like the advent of groups, uh, you know, and like uh, some of the more extreme genre groups that I'm a part of, they're always on high alert because sometimes people like infiltrate and then condemn us all to hell, <laughs> not that we really care. <laughs> I carry a rifle. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Not that we really care, but it's just sort of interesting how it's helped us so much to formulate the communities, but then also given some people a voice to try to destroy those communities, you know. That's true. Although, you know, I had somebody say the other day online, because we were talking about a film that had just come out, and I was saying, oh, I enjoyed the film, but I had problems with thus and such. And one of the people said, you know, why can't people just let... The, f the films alone or whatever, why do they have to take it so personally and point out the bad stuff? And, you know, to me, films are art. Writing is art. Painting is art. There's different forms of art. It should be taken personally. If it's not taken personally, the person doing the art did it wrong. You know, it has to be an individual thing. I learn as much about a film or a book or whatever from a negative review, if it's not a mean-spirited negative of course, review. Of course, or malicious. Or malicious. If, uh, from a negative review as I do a good review, because if I think I'm not going to enjoy something from the negative reviews, and I go and I actually like it, I feel pretty good about it. But if I go to another one of these overhyped, how great it is, and go and you go, uh, that was okay. It was even less than okay because of too much good review. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a place for both. And I think that uh, art should incite conversation. I think uh, we, we walk out of the theater, we should be talking about what we just saw. 
If you look at a piece of art or read a book, you should be discussing that with other people who have seen it or read it because good art should affect you emotionally and you want to discuss that. And in the discussion, you learn something new if you also listen while you talk. I completely agree. It's funny. I read your blog post uh, regarding that topic, uh, and I agreed with so much that was said, even though I personally, I, I believe your standpoint, correct me if I'm wrong, or else it could have been the other person, Leto, in it, uh, but I believe Oh, that Leto guy. Right, <laughs> Leto, from all through the house, um, where you were specifically referencing Guillermo del Toro's, I'm going to blank on the name, at the Shape moment, of Water. The Shape of Water. Yes, as being one of them, and how uh, he's not a freshwater fish, but they kept on putting, or is he a freshwater, either way, they kept putting salt in the, the bathtub. Yeah, well, actually what that conversation that, that you're referencing was about was, why do we allow some films to have plot problems, and it's okay with us because we really like the film, and then other films that have plot problems, but they're no worse than the other thing, we, we crucify it. You know, uh, there's not a movie out there probably or a book that doesn't have plot problems. Oh, no. I always say you, you can't know. make a perfect film. You're going to go insane. It track. was Hitchcock who said, you know, run with it and go as fast as you can so they don't see the holes and, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Because they're going to be there. And, and with every film or every book, I'm willing to suspend logic once. Like, okay, we live in a world where there's monsters. I'll go along with that. Mm -hmm. But then when you start making me suspend over and over and over, you know, then, or if you give me rules and I play in that world and then the writers break their own yes, rules. Yes, you can't, they have to, Matthew Curry Holmes, that, he taught me that very valuable lesson, which is the rules have to be consistent with the world that you're in. Right. Period. Because if there's, if they're not, it's too confusing. You can't explain inconsistent rules or inconsistent logic of the world that you're in in a 90 minute film. And why do we have run into that, say, in two different movies? And in one movie we go, yeah, they broke the rules, but man, I didn't care. I loved that film. And in the other film you go, yeah, that bothered me. That, and yet they both did the same thing. And we were trying to figure out the psychology of, of, <laughs> of how we work that way, why we, we don't mind it in some films, and, and it really drives us nuts in other ones. Did you figure it out? No. <laughs> I mean, for me, I think uh, somebody pointed out in the article is just how well the film overall is executed, uh, yeah. which I think has validity to it. Because for me, I personally did not adore The Shape of Water, uh, mainly because I couldn't get behind the the fish human connection, which I love Doug Jones so much. I think he's brilliant. And if I could ever be attracted to a fish, I swear it would probably be him, but also just not for me. <laughs> well, it was like I had a, my sister said to me, I saw Bird Box the other day, and she goes, I didn't like it. And I said, oh, what didn't you like about it? And she goes, you can't see the thing you're fighting. And I said, well, to me, that's part of the frightening aspect of it. If you can see it, then it's already got you, is the point of the thing. And she goes, yes, but I'm a fighter. I want to, I want to go down swinging. And I couldn't go down swinging in that situation, so I didn't like the movie. And see, that's two different things that I think she's actually talking about. She didn't like the setup, but it doesn't mean the movie wasn't good. Obviously, it affected her. But I love that. Like, as for me, obviously, I did not direct Bird Box. <laughs> However, a review like that. She would have liked to have. I totally would have. <laughs> but a review like that, I consider that a win. I do know? too. Because it got you in the place that it needed you to be in. You right. might still not like it, but. It's you don't have to be happy about successful. everything yeah. you see. And you should, the for me, genre films, if a genre film mass appeals to everyone, it's a fail. Period. We're doing horrible things to great people. You shouldn't, and not everyone should love it. Period. That's true.